got an opportunity now to have rather more than a soundbite, to have a proper discussion. I'm not going to ask our um, panellists to come up here and, and speak one by one, because I suspect that there's, there'll be too many areas where they'd overlap. I think it's more useful uh, if we begin with, um, begin, get straight into a discussion. John, on the end, John Craggs, uh, is currently the Deputy Chief Executive at um, Gentoo Group, uh, England's largest stock transfer. Um, he, uh, uh, in his current role, he has line management responsibility for all the operational units within the group. Um, that's about 1,400 employees, and he has 30 years' experience in a variety of housing organisations um, across the northeast. Stephen Stone uh, is the CEO of Crest Nicholson. Stephen uh, is right next to him there. Um, since 1995, managing director of the group's uh, eastern region. Uh, he's a chartered architect with over 30 years' experience in the construction uh, and house building uh, industry. Uh, Neil Jefferson is uh, the CEO of the Zero Carbon Hub. He's been seconded to the hub from NHBC, where he is general uh, manager. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Edward Brown is senior partner at Davis Langdon. Uh, he's a specialist in the efficient use of materials in construction, having worked closely with RAP for um, a number of years. So I'm going to come down now and, and perch next to them. And if we can begin, um, and why don't we be just sort of go right down the line first of all, in, in, a, in a relatively quick far way. What are the issues um, on this subject? That the 2016 Zero Carbon Homes target has been the flagship um, green building policy. It's three years now since the launch. Uh, is there the clarity? Is the level of energy efficiency high enough? Allowable solutions, are they right? Um, uh, and when it comes to the actual um, uh, standards of building, is the code right? Plus any other questions or, or queries or thoughts that you have, starting with you. Yeah, thanks. Um, for me, I think we are a not-for-profit group, so a registered social landlord, but we're a bit odd because we've also got three commercial companies within the not-for-profit um, uh, group structure. So they make a profit, but we return it to the organisation and then, for example, we've invested in an academy in, in one of the more tricky areas. So, so we try to recirculate uh, that money. So, so when we're looking at what the issues are in relation to, to zero carbon, uh, we're quite unequivocal about it, even though we've got a development team and a construction team. For us, this is, um, it's not about, well, we're in an economic problem and therefore we can put it off at all. It's absolutely, um, how dare we treat the planet in the way that we currently are by arguing the toss about whether we should increase standards and have them consistent across all sectors or not. From our group's point of view, individually and collectively, we want to leave a legacy where we're building new homes. Uh, we've built about 900 new ones. We've got about 30,000 currently. And we're very keen on, uh, we're working on retrofits to a large extent. And we're working on passive house design. Uh, and we're getting our workforce retrained, reskilled, and re energized to realize that they're actually giving something a little bit back rather than us as an organization taking things away. So the big challenge for us is to try and harness the opportunity for residents in Sunderland largely, but in the North East generally, to access good quality accommodation at a price and a location that they can, and to do it in the most sustainable way that we possibly can. So we can argue until we're blue in the face about whether we all understand the definitions or not, but if we accept that that's the end goal um, in sight for everybody, then I think we've got half a chance to get there successfully, regardless of whether you're in a purely commercial organisation or a not-for-profit not for uh, sector. Um, okay, good morning everybody. Well, we are a profit, uh, of a profit organisation, or at least supposed to, and that was until a few years ago, until this housing recession hit, and the profits suddenly turned into big losses. And it's quite interesting in the housing market because it, for 15 years we've had the best credit conditions ever imaginable. So the housing market has been rising every year. And on the back of that, land has been used, because it is a scarce resource, has been used as a great mechanism to provide affordable housing, um, to provide libraries, schools, roads, whatever else is a sort of social tax. And then along a few years ago, it became the code for sustainable homes, which was yet another regulatory burden. Now it's quite interesting, this recession that we've gone through, 
And whilst the market's stabilising now, the price is nowhere near back to where they were at the peak in 2007. But one of the non-negotiables from every local authority, and indeed this government and the Tory government, in, sorry, I said Tory government, in case they become the next government, is that um, sustainability is still a key and core faction. It's non-negotiable. And interestingly, over the last few months in particular of renegotiation with local authorities, the code and the sustainability credentials are not up for grabs. That means as a, an industry is non-negotiable. Now the interesting thing there is, unlike, I was interested in the previous speakers um, at the previous session, where they were talking about carrots and sticks. But with the housing market, it's really a stick because we have regulations, whether you like it or not, coming into full force in a step change through to zero carbon by 2016. So we're having to learn to adapt our business processes in order to achieve that. And when we started, certainly at Crest Nicholson, when we started this process three or four years ago, we had no idea what zero carbon would look like. And even today, if you ask me to describe a zero carbon house in 2016, I can't tell you the answer to that. All I can say is the industry has responded incredibly well over the last few years. So we, all, we thought a while ago Code 3 would be incredibly difficult to get to and the cost burden would be very high. Now that we're at Code 3, actually it's not that bad. We can do it with an all fabric solution without renewables. We're now talking about Code 4. Code 4 actually, interestingly, we can get to with the same work on fabric with a normal amount of work on renewables. So progress is being made as materials, as window suppliers, all work and respond. Now interestingly at Crest along with Barrett and Stuart Milne, we were successful in, in an AMC4 project which looks at a Code 4 solution without renewables. Now at first, I, 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 and that's an R&D project. Now the industry is a cottage industry. R&D is just something that is completely unheard of. We don't allocate budgets, unlike the motor industry or anyone else. It is simply does not exist. So it's actually quite a challenge that in a collaborative way, we work together with other companies, and God forbid we share information. Now we don't share information normally because we're competitors, and land is the key resource. You don't give up your build costs to anybody else because you lose your competitive edge. But we're actually having to do that now because such that 2016 is only a few years away and we need to share those resources. So it's actually quite exciting, but if you take my team, we've got quite a big team in Crest working on that project, and they're all incredibly fired up and enthusiastic about delivering a Code 4 solution without renewables. And of course what's important there is we have a supply chain coming with us. Um, and that's open, in fact, at this um, this session in, in here we're inviting the supply chain to say come and work with us on new solutions on insulation on triple glazing and all of the other parts of the fabric and again i'd just like to, to go back just before i finish on on the previous speakers because we are a cottage in industry the entry barriers for workers are actually very low the industry is made up of the brick layers concrete layers mastic men cleaners it's actually very easy to get into the business. Um, the developer part of it is actually quite complex, but from a build point of view it's easy. And there is a massive opportunity for growth in this country, not just from manufacturers, but from individuals to grow as this industry takes off. So that's probably enough. It's a big challenge, but I think the industry is very much up for it and has made great, great steps to do it. The starting point for me is around this, this issue of, of clarity. For me, we can break this into, into two parts. It's clarity of objective, so where do we want to get to by 2016? And then the tricky bit, the clarity of how we get there. So on the former, on kind of where we want to get to, I think there we've made some real strides. We, we're starting to get a better definition. We've got a good definition of what zero carbon or low carbon means with the use of um, allowable solutions sitting at the top end of the, the pyramid. So that's giving the industry some comfort that at least there's there's a definition that we can measure performance against. The, the challenge that the industry faces is, is then simply how we get there. And breaking that down, I think there are some particular challenges that we're going to have to work through very quickly over the next few years. So from my perspective, a particular challenge is one of cost or price. You know, uh, low carbon, zero carbon buildings, 
simply cost more than buildings that we're building at the moment. You know, that's, that's a fact. Um, we've done some work to kind of look at the scale of that increase. You know, at the moment we're sort of saying it could be around 25% increase to get to that zero carbon uh, threshold. But what we're not considering is some of the technological development that might happen in terms of uh, low carbon technologies within that time frame. You're talking about R&D, so that's a big, a, a big opportunity still. Another issue is around um, the financing. So if houses get more expensive to build, who ends up paying for these houses? Um, are we going to put it all at the house builder? Are we going to put it all at the consumer? You know, these are big decisions that we still need to finance as too. And then for me, you know, particularly important is, is understanding the consumer. It's a little point us building buildings that are fantastically sustainable, uh, but the consumer simply just wants a bit of building that is that is uh, warm and comfortable and safe for the future. So we need to start to think about what the consumer wants from the industry and try and reshape the whole industry rather than just building more and more eco homes. To me, we need to kind of get away from the eco home principle and just talk about homes that happen to be more sustainable. And I think to get to that point, we need to make sure that the the existing stock catches up with where the new stock is heading. Yeah. I know, um, looking around the room, I can see a number of you are engaged with the Zero Carbon Hub already, but for those of you who are not, just to explain what the Zero Carbon Hub is, it's a private-public partnership, which means we've got private sector funding and central government funding from CLG. The main thing we do, I guess, for you guys is that we report into the 2016 Task Force, which is chaired by the Housing Minister, on how we're doing in terms of making progress towards zero carbon homes from 2016 because this is, this is a massive uh, technical challenge and consumers are important as well i'll come back to that in a moment so our job on a quarterly basis is to report against the program it's publicly available on our website red amber green against the overall program and component parts of how we're doing so a lot of our work is around energy efficiency energy supply providing examples to give confidence to the industry that things are beginning to happen but also skills and training but also consumer, and I think the three things that are really important for me for today to talk about, the first one is definition, it's already, already been mentioned. Now here we are in 2010, it's only six years until zero carbon homes come in, and we've been playing around with definition for a few years, but we are making progress. I think we've got some things to sort out this year, allowable solutions are really important. But in terms of the hierarchy for achieving zero carbon, the basis for that is a home which is inherently energy efficient, and we've proposed a standard which is being taken forward now in a consultation on the co sustainable homes. In terms of what level of on-site renewable energy should be provided, well, CLG has provided usefully a, a target for that. The allowable solutions, which is essentially the release valve, because I think it's now recognised that uh, the majority of homes can't be built to true zero carbon on-site, on the plot, with directly connected low and zero carbon technologies, are really important. We need to solve that quickly. Uh, we're expecting a revised version of the code by October, so it gives an idea of how quickly we've got to move. We've got to give certainty to the industry about how much these allowable solutions will cost as well, because people like Stephen need to build that into their land appraisals for land trading. So definition is important, there's a lot of work to do this year and hopefully it will be nailed soon. It's good to see there's a number of things that have happened recent, recently, which have, from government have shown some joined upness which we haven't seen previously. So taking for example non-domestic buildings, we're seeing a similar hierarchy being applied to that. And yesterday's announcement, there's a few things in there which we're encouraging about linking developments together. You can't look at new homes just by themselves. You've got to look at communities, existing buildings as well. The second thing is consumer, and I, I totally agree with, with what Ed has said. I think that for too long we've looked at this as a policy intervention, a technical uh, a challenge, if you like, without thinking about consumers. What is the consumer proposition in all of this? And I think that up until recently we didn't really have much idea of what consumers thought about this policy and how we could advise house builders to market homes on the basis of promoting the benefits of low and zero carbon living. But uh, just uh, last month we launched a report, Marketing New Homes, which is beginning to get some traction in terms of what we should be doing. It's great to see that there is an underlying consumer understanding of reducing carbon emissions and increasing energy efficiency. But in terms of this agenda, believe me, there's not a lot of knowledge out there about zero carbon new homes. And also some of the terminology that we use is quite a switch off as well. Zero carbon new homes, exactly, exactly as Ed said. Start with homes, talk about benefits, they're warm, they're comfortable, and they're cheaper to run. So a lot of work to do on the consumer side. And I guess on the consumer side, the, the big win would be is that we've got a job to do to drive down costs. And the definition work is beginning to help that, together with the points that have been made already about supply chain and innovation. But the utopian position would be to see a premium being paid for sustainable new homes. 
so that people are willing to pay more because they understand that these homes are better and they're cheaper to run. Sadly, we're quite a long way from that. I think that's a real focus for the next year or so as the market recovers, hopefully, showing indications of doing so, that we try to encourage or try to stimulate the market to create the premium for new homes, to so work on the cost and the premium. Also on skills, I think that, you know, again, you can leave consumer rights till 2016, you can leave skills until the end as well. Aside from capacity, capacity issues on skills and knowledge, I think we've got to tackle the people who have left the industry. The industry is about half the size it was a year and a half ago. When they come back, the product's going to be different. Dif different. So we were very pleased to launch a consultation yesterday here at EcoBuild, together with Construction Skills and NHPC, to get your views on what you think the challenges are for the next period. We've already done a lot of, a lot of work already, gathering views. Now it's your turn to give us your views on what you think the challenges are for building low and zero carbon housing. So that for me is the three things. Definition, consumer, and skills. Right, thank you all. And I'm going to throw it open to, to people in, in a few minutes to either make comments or ask questions or a combination of those things. And ask people to be relatively uh, um, brief, but, but I hope that everyone who has something to say on any of the topics that are, that are reached feels that they can have their say before the end of the session.